welcome. Uh, we're delighted to have you here. I'm Gary Hesser, and one of the very special things in my life is to be known as the Martin Olaf Sabo Professor of Citizenship and Learning at Augsburg College. So with that hat on and my long tenure of hanging around in this neighborhood, we welcome those of you from the Cura Housing Forum, students, community people, to this very special occasion. This is our ninth Martin Olaf Sabo Public Policy Forum that we've hosted since the Sable Center came into being five years ago. I want to first introduce Martin Sabo that many of you know, former representative representing this district, state legislator representing this area, and just a little footnote that you'll find on the back of your program, a very special event at the University of Minnesota on the 9th of October in which a book written called Minnesota's Miracle When Government Really Worked, which is a book about the decade that Martin was Speaker of the House in the state of Minnesota. So you're welcome, but RSVP for that. But we're delighted to have Martin here. Sylvia is off traveling, so I can't introduce her. We ask many of you who came in and didn't quite look like a current student to put your name and email address on a list out front. And if you didn't do that, I would hope and invite you to do that so that we could be sure to notify you of a future SABO Symposia on public policy issues. I'm delighted to introduce one of our SABO scholars, uh, Maria Masha Shatanova who comes to us to Augsburg from the Russian Federation, the Republic, do I say Federation or Republic? Federation. She's a senior economics and business major with a double major in international relations. She's a disabled scholar, a leader and active person in IMPERG. And we are delighted to have her introduce our two speakers, our speaker and our respondent for today, Masha. Hope you're having a great day today. George Gelster is the distinguished Clarence Hilbert Professor of Urban Affairs at Wayne State University in Detroit. His research and speaking engagements focus on sprawl, its nature, causes, and consequences, neighborhood dynamics and threshold points, and affordable housing. His research has been supported by major grants from the Ford Foundation, the U.S. Geological Survey, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Professor Gelster was the Carnegie Centenary Professor at Glasgow, Glasgow University in 2010. He has also been at the Urban Institute and a visiting professor at many universities. His publications number in the hundreds. He, his most recent book, Driving Detroit, The Quest for Respect in the Motor City, was just released this summer and is available for purchase. William Julius Wilson, the illustrious Harvard scholar, concludes that indeed Gelster's Illuminating analysis is a must read. There will be a seminar and reception at the University of Minnesota tomorrow at 4 p.m. focusing on this book. He has his PhDs, his PhD is in, in economics from the MIT. And our second guest today is Michael Grover, who is a manager of the Community Development Department at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. His research interests focus on mortgage lending, home ownership, urban development, and community development corporations. Prior to joining the Minneapolis Fed, Michael worked as a senior labor market analyst for the state of Minnesota's health and employment and economic development departments. He obtained a PhD in urban studies from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. On behalf of Sabre Center and Augsburg College, I'm pleased to welcome you both to this ninth Sabo Public Policy Symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Martin. It's my great professional and personal privilege to be here this afternoon. It's a professional privilege to be part of the Martin Sabo Lecture Series. And it's my personal pleasure for a variety of reasons. They can all be summarized by the fact that I feel at home here. Why? 
My home church growing up in Toledo, Ohio was Augsburg Lutheran Church. Sound familiar? As an undergraduate, I went to Wittenberg University in Ohio, a small Lutheran school. Jokingly, we added for small Lutherans. And of course, this is the home base for the last third of a century for my longest standing professional friend and colleague, Gary Hesser. If that wasn't enough to cinch the deal, here is a college that unabashedly builds itself as the place that has a calling for serving your neighbor. It doesn't get any better than this from my perspective. And of course, that's a perfect segue into my topic for discussion this afternoon, which has everything to do about neighborhoods and who our neighbor is. Let me try to give you a little historical background on this question of neighborhood mix. Historical background that fr frankly spans Gary's and my professional careers because we both got our intellectual and ethical feet wet during a civil rights period of great foment, foment when the discussion about neighborhoods and who should live in neighborhoods and how they should be mixed was essentially a black-white discussion. The whole discussion was focused on neighborhood mix from an integrationist perspective, blacks living with whites, or in that case, blacks not living with whites because of the high levels of segregation back then. So there was a whole bunch of policy responses at this point. Uh, the policy responses had to do in those days with essentially school busing, uh, the Fair Housing Act, which came in in 1968, and some interesting neighborhood integration strategies that a few localities start institute during that time. However, things changed in the late 1980s, and the focus on race was de-emphasized, and instead the focus shifted to concentrations of poverty, uh, concentrations of disadvantaged populations, overwhelmingly minority, but it became more of an issue of a class segregation, not necessarily racial segregation. And as this attention focus changed, so did our policy responses. In the last couple of decades, we haven't seen much attention to racial integration. In fact, the Supreme Court has kind of put the kibosh on that emphasis. So instead, we've seen public policy looking at whether people who hold rental vouchers live in a particular neighborhood which has high concentrations of poverty or whether they are assisted to move to areas of advantage with low concentrations of poverty. We've had scattered site public housing, which tries to build, in, instead of large-scale developments in poor neighborhoods, smaller-scale developments, hopefully scattered in decent neighborhoods. We've had the Hope Six Project, which is a national program to take large-scale, disadvantaged, dilapidated public housing projects and replace them with mixed-income communities. And of course, we've had an inclusionary zoning, or IZ, initiative in several states, which forces new developments to set aside a certain fraction of its dwellings for sale or rental below market rates to try to get a mix of incomes being represented within that population and that development. So given that background, let me try to offer a preview of what I hope to accomplish in the next couple of minutes. First of all, I hope to analyze in a critical way three points. First of all, what is the diagnosis that connects the particular mix of people in a neighborhood to a particular set of social problems? Is that diagnosis on target? The second part, is the prescription of past federal policies in light of that diagnosis sensible? And lastly, I'm going to suggest that there's a new medicine that could come out of the Department of Housing and Urban Development that might be a more beneficial, equitable, and efficient approach to dealing with issues of inappropriate neighborhood mixes or lack of mixing. Let me give you my punchlines right up front. Here they are. I'm going to argue that the diagnosis is sound. That is to say that there is strong evidence that concentrations of disadvantaged folks in certain neighborhoods is a bad thing for the nation, both on equity grounds and efficiency grounds, both of which I will explain in a moment. However, I'm going to argue that the prescription, the policy response to that, has been flawed in a variety of ways. We haven't understood how complex this notion of neighborhood mix is, and as a result, we have done it very badly at the federal level. 
And lastly, I'm going to suggest, however, that there are sensible prescriptions, which might even be politically feasible, that I'm going to suggest HUD pursue in the next administration. So those are the punchlines. If you'd like to take a 30-minute nap and come back later, you haven't missed a thing. So here we go. Uh, policy rationales. Now, tradition policymakers have argued that public policy can either be justified on equity grounds or efficiency grounds. Equity grounds is on the grounds of fairness. We're doing this because it's fair to some group in society. And so obviously, that's an important ground. And in this particular discussion, I'm going to be using this equity criteria to mean if the policy in question benefits the disadvantaged groups in our society in an absolute sense. And I'm using this word disadvantage intentionally in an ambiguous way so that we can think of them as being uh, in a racial minority group that isn't in an advantaged position, or we can think of them in a disadvantaged economic position, lower income profile or lower education. But the second criteria can be equally important. That's the efficiency criteria. This is based roughly on old utilitarian ideas of the greatest good for the greatest number. And so what I'm going to be talking about today when I say efficiency is essentially, does the policy in question benefit the society as a whole if you add up the benefits to both the advantaged groups in society and the disadvantaged groups in society, such that the gains and losses somehow, if we could aggregate them, would end up being a positive gain for society as a whole. That's what I mean by efficiency. Now, I've already said that equity itself could justify a public policy, but it's my humble opinion that equity and fairness isn't paramount in a lot of the decision making today in Washington. It's really about efficiency. Indeed, a lot of federal programs can only be justified today if somehow they prove that they're efficient, if they prove that they're somehow producing a net gain for society as a whole. Traditionally, the left focuses on equity, the political right focuses on efficiency, so today I want to give equal handed, even handed treatment here. I want to look at both efficiency and equity concerns and see if our concern about neighborhood mix might meet both criteria. So the key issue here to arguing about whether public policies to achieve neighborhood mix are going to be justified on efficiency grounds is whether the effect of neighborhood on human behaviors and outcomes is a nonlinear effect or not. Now, this sounds like a very complicated idea, a nonlinear effect. What in the world does he mean by this? What I mean is whether the effect of neighborhood social mix happens at a constant rate, no matter what that extra mix is, or whether there are some kinds of threshold points where past that threshold, very different things kind of happen. And now, to demonstrate this point, I need my assistants to join me. So I've already had some volunteers <laughs> who will come up to help me with this conversation. And this little demonstration is what I call the saga of the caps and the no caps. All right, now we have, in this little hypothetical society, two kinds of people, the cap people and the no cap people. I'm also a no cap people. Now, we have these people right now in two different neighborhoods, the cap neighborhood, the no cap neighborhood, all right? And now we're going to ask the question, can society be made better off by mixing these people around? Currently, they're segregated, right? There's a segregated all cap neighborhood, a segregated all non cap neighborhood. Can we get society better off by mixing them? Well, the answer depends on what you assume the effect of the neighborhood is on the behavior and well-being of these people. Let's take one assumption, an assumption about non-linear effects. What do I mean by that? I mean, let's assume that each one of us non-cap people carry with us, no matter where we live, a quantum of badness. That is to say, imagine that no matter where we live, we act out in a way that really bothers our neighbors. For example, imagine that at two in the morning, every night, we sing, a mighty fortress is our God, badly off key, and loudly. 
All right, so that's the negative externality that we produce no matter where we live. Okay, so we could put all three of us together and we would have three quanti of badness here because we'd all be every, every night singing this song badly. But what happens if we mix things around? And what if they, through some kind of policy, move me over here to this neighborhood? Now, I'm still going to be doing my thing and I'm producing this quantum of badness for the ears of these guys. I'm not producing my quantum of badness to the ears of those guys. But is society as a whole better off? No. That neighborhood's better off because they have negative one of me's living there. But this neighborhood is worse off because they have plus one of me living there. So if you still add up the well-being of both neighborhoods, there's still three of us that are imposing these quantum of badness around. One, two, and three. So we haven't gained anything for society as a whole. We have a zero-sum outcome. We're just moving around the problem. We're not making the total aggregation of that problem any different. That's the linear assumption. But the world may work in nonlinear ways. Let me take a different assumption, and you'll see a different outcome. Imagine that instead of all of us carrying around this quantum of badness no matter where we are and in what context we're operating, it takes a threshold quantity of us before this bad thing happens. Imagine that it takes three of us in the same neighborhood before we start to sing A Mighty Fortress Is Our, car, is our God off key and loudly and maybe in three-part harmony badly. Well, if that's the way the world works, that we don't sing at all unless we get at least a trio of us going, what would happen in that public policy scenario? Well, if we have complete segregation and three of us together, we're all going to start singing, we're going to generate our quantum of badness, one, two, three, but what if I am moved over to this cap neighborhood again? Now, is society better off? Absolutely. I don't sing because I don't have my requisite companions. They don't sing because they don't have their requisite trio. Nobody is singing, and therefore society is better off. In that case, creating neighborhood mixture between caps and no caps made one neighborhood better off, that's them, and this neighborhood no worse off. That's a net gained society. Some are made better, nobody's made worse, Pareto Pareto improvements, as the economists would say. Thank you very much. Give these folks a hand. Aren't they good as demonstrators? So, that's the hypothetical. What does the evidence say? Does the world work in a linear way or a nonlinear way when it comes to the relationship between various social problems and neighborhood mix? Well, there's some pretty strong evidence on this. And I've summarized the evidence in this picture. Let me quickly lay it out for you. On the vertical axis, I'm putting a generic label called the rate of social problems that manifest themselves in this neighborhood. This could be everything from dropping out of high school to having kids as teenagers to committing crimes. On the horizontal axis, we have the poverty rate in the neighborhood. Now, there are a series of studies in a variety of disciplines that have looked at different social outcomes that individuals engage in, certain behaviors that they engage in, as a function of the kind of poverty rate in their neighborhood in which they're living. And these studies all come to remarkably similar conclusions, and that's what's embedded here. The remarkably similar conclusions are that at approximately 20% of poverty rates in a neighborhood, you start to get negative externalities. That is to say, other people in the neighborhood start behaving in ways that society would wish they didn't behave. And that rate starts to escalate until the poverty rate gets to about 40%, and then it doesn't get any worse. It kind of tapers off again. So that suggests that there's a threshold point, someplace around 20% poverty, where bad things start to happen to people in these concentrated poverty neighborhoods. There's other evidence which comes to the same conclusion. There's a study that I did a couple of years ago that looks at how property values change as the poverty rate of a neighborhood changes. And again, you see a remarkably similar picture, although this is sort of flipped on its head. 
Property values, of course, is a way to capitalize in a housing market situation whether there are social problems going on in the neighborhood. And what you see is that, again, as the poverty rate increases in a neighborhood, the property values are not negatively influenced until the poverty rate gets above about 15%. Only above that threshold do you start to see declines in property value associated with increases in low-income populations living in that place. Both of these come to the same conclusion about nonlinearities. They come to the conclusion that if you could imagine a world where there are no concentrations of poverty over about 15 or 20 percent, you would see a remarkable reduction in the overall rate of social problems. And that clearly is an argument for the efficiency of programs that aim to achieve deconcentrations of disadvantage as the long-term goal. So, where do these nonlinear relationships come from? Well, I want to stress that they can come from two sources. One of these sources comes from inside the neighborhood, and one of them comes from outside of the neighborhood. First of all, the ones within the neighborhood could come about because of social interactions between the residents themselves. You could imagine that socialization patterns and norms could only start to be influential on people's behavior once that group reaches a certain critical threshold amount where their influence on the neighborhood becomes dominant. And until that point, there's a minority view and nobody's going to conform to that norm. So that could be one reason of why there's this threshold relationship that I've talked about before. Another possibility could be ha having nothing to do with the people who live there, it's the people who live outside that place, however. It could be that the actions of external players, major institutional decision makers, political leaders, and so forth, are influencing what goes on in that neighborhood. It could be, for example, that as the neighborhoods exceed 20% poverty rates, the outside world starts reacting in ways that disproportionately penalizes people in those neighborhoods through stigmatization, withdrawal of economic resources, and so forth, uh, reductions in public service or different kinds of policing strategies. You can imagine lots of ways in which this nonlinear effect comes when a neighborhood crosses a threshold where the outside world starts perceiving them as inferior places and because of their behavioral reactions create self-fulfilling prophecies. So I don't want to blame the victim here. I don't want to say that it's low-income people themselves that create problems when the concentrations exceed over 20%. That may be part of the story, but it certainly is not the entire story. Uh, the second thing I want to emphasize is that not all concentrations of disadvantage are alike. There are at least two broad classifications, potentially, of neighborhoods which by many indicators could be disadvantaged in that they have generally low incomes, maybe they're minority or immigrant status, but they aren't necessarily all equally creating social problems. There's one kind of neighborhood which I call a flypaper neighborhood. These are disadvantaged neighborhoods where if somebody falls into them, they stick. They can't escape either from the neighborhood itself or from the low income position that the neighborhood helps keep them in. It's, if you will, social glue that reduces their economic mobility over time. But there's a second potential kind of low-income disadvantaged neighborhood, and that's what I call a springboard neighborhood. The springboard neighborhood are places that, for one reason or another, even though they're disadvantaged, provide some valuable human or social or financial capital to low-income people that actually aids their upward mobility. And here the classic illustration are immigrant enclaves where because of language skills and internal lending processes, it's possible to imagine a concentrated disadvantaged neighborhood that constantly is pulling in new disadvantaged immigrants, but launching them into the mainstream society after a few years of acculturation. So, what have I said so far? I've suggested that although generally concentrations of disadvantage may be harmful for society, what about policy prescriptions? Should we just willy-nilly say, do away with segregation? Well, it's a little more complicated than that. And I'd like to bring up three major challenges to public policy that tries to massage neighborhood mix to the benefit of the nation as a whole. 
The first challenge is that neighborhood mix itself is an extremely slippery concept. Secondly, that there are several ways that you could, in principle, go about mixing neighborhoods, but each of them have different benefits and costs, and as I'll show in a moment, unfortunately, we seem to have chosen the strategies which have had the biggest costs and the least benefits. And the third point I'd like to make about policy is that our strategies may impose heavy burdens on the disadvantaged populations who may be forced to move from their traditional neighborhoods as a part of these strategies. So let me unpack each of these points for a moment. First of all, what do we mean about mixing neighborhoods? Well, it seems to me that at fundamental levels, we have to be more specific in thinking about these three dimensions of neighborhood mix. Composition, concentration, and scale. What do I mean by these things? Concentra composition, what are the dimensions of mix that we care about? Who are the people that we care about mixing together in a neighborhood as a public policy goal? Do we care about mixing racial or ethnic groups? Do we care about mixing economic groups? Do we care about mixing religious groups? All of that has to be decided. The second dimension, concentration. Once we have decided what kinds of people we hope to mix together, what's the ratios of the different groups? At what concentrations are we aiming? And last but not least is the aspect of scale. Over what geographic area do we care that mixing occurs? Do we want mixing in every little apartment building? Or do we want buildings to be not necessarily mixed, but maybe at a block we want to have mixture across the buildings. Or maybe it's not a block, maybe it's a whole census tract of several thousand people where there can be some segregation within that whole census tract, but the tract as a whole is mixed. What's the scale over which the mixing takes place? We have to specify that as well. Now to put these criteria together, it's equivalent to a recipe. If you were baking a recipe for neighborhood mix, what would you need to do? Well, you have to figure out the ingredients, you have to figure out which proportions of the ingredients you're going to use, and you have to figure out how big a bowl to mix the ingredients in. And unfortunately, public policy hasn't been very clear about any of these dimensions of social mix policy. They've just been winging it in an ad hoc fashion, and that unfortunately has caused some problems, as we'll talk about. The second potential caveat about public policy and neighborhood mix has to do with the particular strategies that are considered. There are three basic approaches, just definitionally, that you could go about taking if you're trying to achieve more neighborhood mix. First of all, you could focus on the advantaged neighborhoods, which are predominantly occupied by advantaged folks, and you could potentially try to open up housing options for disadvantaged people in those locations. So if you will, you're trying to integrate segregated advantaged neighborhoods. That's sort of strategy option number one. And you could do that either with assisted housing policy that is site-based, meaning that somehow affordable dwellings are created in this neighborhood, either by rehabilitating existing dwellings or perhaps building new dwellings in some kind of scattered site assisted housing fashion. Or another strategy that is within the feasibility of American public policy right now is to use rental vouchers, the Housing Choice Voucher Program, formerly Section 8, and perhaps help voucher holders to move into neighborhoods that previously they didn't live in through opening up opportunities in the private rental market in sort of the medium expense range of private apartments. So that's general strategy number one. Integrate the segregated advantage neighborhoods. The second strategy is to think about disadvantage concentrations and try to integrate them with more advantaged people. Now, this kind of option uh, typically in the past has taken the form in the United States of public housing redevelopment. The Hope, Six, 
program being the most famous slash infamous example of that. Uh, the choice neighborhoods variant today being used by the Obama administration being another. In this kind of strategy, you're essentially demolishing what was a concentration of disadvantage and trying to rebuild it as a mixed income, maybe mixed tenure, maybe mixed uh, race redevelopment. And that would be an illustration of this kind of strategy. The third kind of strategy that one could imagine is to develop new residential areas that are being created either downtown in a redevelopment parcel or on the suburban fringe in a farm parcel. And you could imagine through inclusionary zoning laws requiring those developments that pass a certain threshold scale to include a mixture of priced dwellings so that you could get a different kind of economic mix than simply a monochromatic kind of mix in that particular neighborhood. Those are the three general kinds of strategies. We've had elements of public policy, as you can see, that have pursued each of those. If you'd like in the Q&A, we can talk more about the costs and benefits of each of these strategies, but all of them are considerably different in that cost-benefit ratio. The last policy caveat that I'd like to bring to your attention is this one about who pays the price for a neighborhood mix strategy. And unfortunately, uh, we've had a long and sullied history of imposing heavy costs on the disadvantaged groups themselves as a consequence of our neighborhood mix strategy. We have, for example, in our policies, uh, moved low-income people out of their long-standing neighborhoods, and as a result of that, ruptured ties of what has been called bonding capital, friendship and kin networks that provide very important financial and psychological supports to low-income people in time of need. We've also uh, not often considered the possibility that by moving low-income and disadvantaged groups, they lose social institutions that have built up in their community to serve them, that no longer can easily support them when they move far away. We're talking about perhaps public service agencies or perhaps religious institutions that provide important services, but access to these services can be very important. The next thing that we often have imposed on low-income folks is a process of neighborhood mixing is that we've actually unwittingly created a loss of their housing subsidy. So for example, in the HOPE 6 redevelopments, we've often told people, well, you have to move out of this public housing development because we're going to demolish your building soon. Fine. Where are you going to go? Well, often the answer has been, we're not sure where you're going to go, but here is a rental voucher that you can use to find an apartment in the decent quality rental market. Have a nice day. Good luck. Well, in very tight metropolitan housing markets, it's not easy for people to find those decent rental apartments that will take a voucher, because landlords currently don't have to take a voucher. And as a result, after six months, typically, that voucher becomes ineligible, and they've lost their housing subsidy, and they're out on the street in a very worse situation than what they started out with. Last but not least, obviously, the process is stressful, and disadvantaged groups who are being asked sometimes to go into environments which are completely foreign to them culturally, far away from their roots of support in parts of the metropolitan area with which they have no familiarity, that is a stressful, stressful ingredient. So in all of these dimensions, we have a bad track record of accomplishing mixed policy on the backs of the people that ostensibly we are trying to help. So, Gary has asked me a provocative question in preparing this talk. If I were the new HUD secretary, what I would do on one of my better days within the optimism of uh, a new dawn that might be potentially politically feasible. And as you'll see on the next slide, it's things that I would only imagine doing if I were king and had absolute power to do anything I wanted. So I'm going to start with the ones that are more modest and maybe have a shred of political feasibility and then go to the next slide. First of all, if I were a secretary of HUD, I would always emphasize that 
mixing policy should be done on the basis of voluntary moves by everybody, advantaged groups and disadvantaged groups alike. Secondly, I would emphasize gradualist approaches. Slowly create more housing options for everyone, advantaged groups in disadvantaged areas, and in advantaged areas, more options for disadvantaged groups, so that over time, you would eventually see an adjustment of a metropolitan housing market. That's the only way to achieve something, with, it seems to me, without imposing huge cost, typically on the disadvantaged group. Second thing, of course, as I do is I'd be very careful about just broad brushing disadvantaged areas and saying, those have to go. Because as I've argued before, there are springboard neighborhoods that probably serve a good function, not only for the disadvantaged group, but for the society as a whole. And you certainly don't want to blow them up or bulldoze those kinds of neighborhoods, the immigrant enclaves, for example. Third thing, though, is I would really worry about what happens to disadvantaged folks if they're involved in a social mix policy. And so first of all, I would try to figure out what social welfare menu of substitutes might be considered to substitute for the bonding capital that disadvantaged people might have to give up when they move from their traditional neighborhoods. You could imagine a package that includes subsidized childcare, uh, transportation in the form of a used car, and other kinds of assistance that makes it feasible for low-income families to imagine moving to the suburbs, getting to childcare, getting to their job, uh, which doesn't rely on informal childcare networks and doesn't rely on what are often creaky public transportation systems. The next thing is that I would try to provide pre-move mobility counseling. By this I mean that Low-income people have to be assisted often, just like everybody in the housing market has to be assisted when they're thinking about moving to a different kind of neighborhood about which they know very little. And as I argued a moment ago, sometimes our programs have been expecting low-income people to move to suburbs which are for them psychologically like moving to the far side of the moon. It's an area that's completely alien to them, completely foreign to them, and so there needs to be a great deal of assistance to both help people see these neighborhoods, find locations that are available to them in these neighborhoods, show them where the schools would be, where they would shop, where they would go to church, the whole bit. Now we have some successful examples of how to do this, but we have not adopted that as a national policy thus far. And last, we wouldn't stop at that point. We wouldn't say, okay, here's your, here's your dwelling in the suburbs, uh, disadvantaged person, have a nice life. No, there should be cons consistent monitoring and follow-up. Again, this means implicitly expanding our social services provision. I'm going beyond HUD secretary here. I've had a martini lunch with HHS secretary here, by the way, and we've had an agreement that we're going to share some of our services in a collaborative way, in case you haven't made that very clear. Um, so we're really talking about making sure that all the ingredients for success are there. Follow-up to figure out whatever barriers are preventing disadvantaged folks from succeeding in an advantaged environment. Is it a problem with childcare? Is it a problem with transportation? Is it a problem relating to their neighbors? Whatever it is, there should be sufficient social welfare supports so that they can be successful. All right, now, what if I, what if I were king? And by king, I mean someone with absolute power. I didn't have to worry about budgets. I didn't have to worry about political feasibility. I could simply, by dictate, say, here's what we're going to do, America. Well, here's what I'd do. Uh, I'd, first of all, make decent, affordable housing a right in America. I'd follow the UN Charter, which has suggested that advanced civilized societies should have this as a human right in their society. And so I would fully fund enough of either the low-income housing tax credit program or other housing supply programs for affordable housing. I would fund enough housing rental vouchers. I would do whatever budgetarily it took to make sure that eligible households could get some kind of housing subsidy in the United States. Now that's radical because today, at best, a quarter of all the people who qualify for federal housing subsidies actually get them because we have been so cheap in funding the existing housing programs. Second thing as I do is I would change the federal fair housing law. 
right now, source of income is not a protected class under federal fair housing law. Meaning that if a landlord of an apartment looks at you and says, aha, you're a holder of a Section 8 voucher. I don't want to rent to you just for that fact alone. That's legal. I change that. Some cities have already done that, notably New York City. State of Massachusetts has done that. It's not the national policy. It should be. What that would do is open up many other opportunities for disadvantaged people holding vouchers to move to advantaged neighborhoods should they wish to do so. I would also intensify fair housing enforcement because we know that many disadvantaged groups can afford, one way or another, subsidized or not subsidized, to move into many neighborhoods. We know they want to do that, but we know that there's still discrimination based on illegal categories like gender, family status, race, ethnicity, religion, that keeps them from making that move, that keeps people who want to achieve neighborhood mix from actually making that happen. And the reason why I know this is that the last four national studies of housing market discrimination conducted by the Department of Housing and Urban Development have found large amounts of housing discrimination continuing in the United States, 68 fair housing law, 1988 fair housing law amendments notwithstanding. And I can't tell you the results, but we also did a testing study in 2011. The results will come out hopefully later this year, and you'll see again this problem is with us continually. We have not budgeted much for HUD or the Department of Justice to seriously enforce the fair housing law, we need to do that. Next thing I would do, if I were king, if, yes. We have in the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program our major supplier of affordable housing in America today, what's called a qualified census tract aspect. And that is where developers who apply to use tax credits in high poverty neighborhoods are actually given extra points in their application to encourage them to develop in high poverty neighborhoods. Now, I know this is popular with local politicians, but I think it's absolutely wrong-headed social policy because it simply reconcentrates poverty in most circumstances, and it doesn't really lead to the revitalization of these neighborhoods. Now, sometimes tax credit developments can be very useful in neighborhoods which are gentrifying, and they can lock in some affordable housing in what otherwise would become a completely unaffordable neighborhood. So in those rare circumstances, the tax credit can be used as a vehicle for preserving diversity that would otherwise disappear. But right now, it's mainly being used to preserve concentrations of disadvantage, and I think that's a stupid federal regulation that I'd change overnight. Last thing is I, I require a metro regional plan as a condition of all federal dollars. Now, Myron, I know you're going to love this kind of pie in the sky thinking, but here it goes anyway. Uh, imagine that, that I would say all the federal dollars you get, community development block grant, home dollars, iced tea dollars, any kind of federal largesse, you can't have it unless your region gets together and comes up with an acceptable plan. And in this plan, you're going to have to come up with a regional growth boundary that says, I'm not going to let this metropolitan area expand beyond this line in the sand until I built up the core to a sufficient density. Second thing I would mandate is that we have a regional fair share plan. This sounds very familiar to folks from the Twin Cities, a plan that basically says all the suburban communities are going to develop their fair share of affordable housing through one kind of subsidy program or another. And last but not least, again, drum roll for the Twin Cities, I would create some kind of tax base sharing program, maybe on the Minnesota model, maybe something like that, uh, but some way to equalize the fiscal capabilities of the different jurisdictions that comprise a metropolitan area because right now those fiscal inequalities are driving many residential choices which are leading to increasing segregations of population and by default a segregation of the disadvantaged who have the least options and are being left behind in very poor financial straits in very poor financial jurisdictions. So that's what I would do if I were king. So, what have I said thus far? Let me review my basic points. First of all, 
I've argued that there is a strong evidence base to worry about neighborhood mix. It really should be in the forefront of American public policy. I've argued that there is a justification to try to aim to get rid of concentrations of disadvantage on both grounds of equity and grounds of social efficiency. That is to say, arguing that it's probably good to advance the opportunities of the disadvantaged group and it's probably good for society as a whole. Secondly, I've argued, even if the diagnosis is valid, however, that the prescription is not. The prescription that we've used in the past has been ill-formed. It hasn't clearly specified the goals for what kind of mix we're aiming for. It's involved particular kinds of policy alternatives that I've suggested have imposed heavy costs on the disadvantaged group. We can do better. And I've suggested ways that HUD or some uh, hypothetical king of the country could do it better. So, is neighborhood mix of importance? Absolutely. Have we done it well in the past? Not really. Could we do it better in the future? I would hope so. So, I thank you very much for your detention. I welcome your comments and questions at the end. And I get to speak for an organization that most people think is um, uh, invisible, trans not very transparent. The Federal Reserve Bank itself has an interest in these sorts of research policy discussions that go on. In particular, the, the part of the bank that I work in, which is called the Community Development Office, um, we provide technical assistance, we provide outreach, we do a lot of work with community and economic development organizations who work in low and moderate income communities. So hearing what George had to say today, hearing about different ideas, theoretical ideas that are out there about what could work with neighborhoods is something that we care about and, and certainly something that we want to, to think about and see what gains traction. And certainly in our office, we know that um, we can design our own programs and services and what we do. And we do a fair amount of analysis and looking at urban problems along with working on issues related to Native American reservations, small business development, and community reinvestment strategies. So coming here today, I'm not an academic, even though I have academic degrees, I have a PhD in urban studies, and you know, even back as a doctoral student, I was reading George Galster's work. So I'm not, a, I'm not a, coming here as an academic today, but I'm really coming here as a person who's interested in policy development and seeing what happens when these sorts of theoretical ideas get tried on the ground. Because in listening to George today talk about these um, great ideas about neighborhood mix and also reading an article that he wrote as well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that, that there's enough research and that there's enough evidence to support these ideas, but as he seems to be suggesting when he needs to be king, I think a lot of remedies or a lot of talk about remedying these sorts of social ills are, are going to be really troublesome and are really going to take a long time to do. So just to review here, we're talking about residential social mix. That is the, the mixing of different social and income classes, racial, racial, ethnic, or Im immigrant groups and neighborhoods. George has examined it from two different um, arguments, the equity and efficiency arguments, and he's used, and through much of his work, he's used U US and European case studies for this. And he finds that some, some improvements for disadvantaged populations and social societal advantages likely result when residential diversity exists and argues that it ought to be promoted. He also identifies in his article that there, there's a clear role for planners and policymakers to, to play in promoting resident, uh, residential diversity. So I have a number of different problems with some of the definitions that George has used, and, and I'll, I'll kind of discuss them right now. One small methodological issue that I have concerns how he's comparing neighborhoods and neighborhoods over time. Neighborhoods, in my research, tend to be dynamic places with different degrees of residential mobility and turnover. And when in looking at some of George's research, it looks like he's comparing neighborhoods really in a static sort of way, um, and, looking at, and not necessarily looking at, that, at them over time and how they can change. Also, um, when George refers to, his to neighborhoods here, and this is also true with other social scientists, they're often referring to neighborhoods as census tracts. 
Um, so census track as a proxy for a neighborhood is often a poor, albeit convenient way to organize data for analysis. But on the contrary, neighborhood residents tend not to see their lives in terms of whatever FIPS code they live in or whatever census tract number they live in. Um, there are also implications here, too, because George is really talking from an urban policy perspective here. You know, are there implications for non-urban areas? Are there implications for smaller cities and rural areas um, within the same sort of framework of residential social mix that, that ought to be considered? And in addition, while Professor Galster has, has done really some heavy lifting, theoretical lifting here, I still see the need to do more research. A fair number of the studies that he's, that he's cited and quoted in his work were really studies that were focused on other sorts of things, and he's brought them into this neighborhood mix um, theoretical construct. And, and really, I think there's a greater need for doing more research under this guise of looking at a residential mix when arguably there aren't very many that are there now. Um, if you could pull up the map for a second. So in thinking about these articles, reading them on a plane, trying to think about um, how I'd respond listening to them today, really I was, tr I, I don't think in these comparisons of looking at Amsterdam or Finland or looking at the entire United States, I tend to look at these things as local sorts of issues. And for me, my reference point is the Twin Cities. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis has a geography that goes from the UP of Michigan all the way out to Montana. And our major metro area that we look at and examine is the Twin Cities. So all I've done here in putting this map together, and, and I advise you not to do maps um, with ArcGIS when you're at home trying to, in, trying to work on the, on the network on, at your work, because it will take hours to do these sorts of things. So I wanted to get a sense for where these geographies are that George talks about in the Twin Cities, just to give you a sense for some of the dynamics that we have to consider here in thinking about these sorts of policy interventions that George has talked about. What I've done here is looked at poverty rates by census tracts. Once again, I'm falling into my own problem here of saying census tracts constitute neighborhoods, but I have no other alternative. Um, and I've looked at, and I've plotted out here those sorts of areas that are either less than 20%, and those come across here as white or gray. So these are areas, arguably, that, have, that, are, that meet the definition of being somehow residentially diverse in, under George's definition. And then I map out areas where, from let's say 20 to 50% of the poverty rate, people, households are in poverty. Those appear in yellow. And then red, where we really have um, major poverty occurring. We have 50% of more of households in, in, in poverty. So in thinking about these map, or in thinking about this map, and thinking about this, the implications of having a residential diversity um, that, uh, that it's, a, it's a good for both the residents who are disadvantaged as well as a societal good, um, there's a vast area um, and a vast population within the Twin Cities that arguably would need to be affected by these policies or by, this, by these sorts of interventions that George is talking about. There has been a great deal of effort already um, underway in the past decades in these areas, and these areas haven't necessarily changed all that much since the night, since certainly since the 80s and 90s. And some would say that um, the, the results haven't been necessarily all that dramatic in terms of reshaping uh, the poverty landscape in the Twin Cities. So for me, that, what this illustrated for me in, in mapping this out and taking a look at what was involved, the task is really is, is daunting to reduce and disperse poverty in, in the Twin Cities region. So how can, and George raises this question as well, but how can we best accomplish this noble goal of residential social mix with fewer resources and limited political will. So for me, this came down to this whole idea that we often talk about in the Fed, and I should have also early on referred that these are my words alone, not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, but we often talk about these ideas of people versus place. And where should you make investments? Should you make investments in the people who are disadvantaged, or should you make investments in the places that are disadvantaged? Should you make investments, and certainly a lot of the work that Rolnick has done around early childhood development suggests that early intervention with people can have both the greatest influence on those individuals, but also have greater societal 
um, effects as well. But certainly some of the work that George has done earlier on suggests that there, there might be a way of combining the two. That there might be a way of combining both resources and targeting a certain area of, of a disadvantage to get an optimal outcome. So, and maybe we can talk, maybe George can allude to some of this later when we get to his, some of those comments. Um, some of the work that he's done in looking at target neighborhood investments in Richmond, Virginia, suggests that both from a place and a person, and a place and a people perspective, combining a lot of resources, in other words, not spreading it thin like peanut butter across places, um, does have an important effect. Most of all, and here I'll wrap up, I'd like to hear more about what Professor Galster has to say about what work what would work here in the Twin Cities, what he's seen in, in his travels across Europe and across the United States about what sorts of um, incremental sorts of efforts we could use to get to where residential social mix is a viable opportunity in the Twin Cities. So, thank you. First of all, thank you very much, Michael, for your insightful and probing questions and comments. Let me first start with this very important point about what a neighborhood is and what it means for neighborhood mixed policy. Obviously, defining what a neighborhood is is equivalent to the holy grail in terms of social science because we know that individuals define neighborhoods very differently even if they live right next to each other and they're very fuzzy edged social spaces. So given that reality, what do you do about neighborhood mixing policy? Well, I think the answer goes back to what is it about place that you think has the biggest influence on people's opportunities? Is it social interaction with your neighbors? Is it the fact that you might role model one of your neighbor's behaviors? Is it the fact that you might share some networks of information and resources with your neighbors? Is that how the mechanism of neighborhood affects your opportunity? If so, that implies that the mixture needs to be at a relatively small geographic scale, certainly smaller than a census tract, maybe at the block face scale, to get people's paths crossing so they see each other, talk to each other, run into each other, and that kind of intimate social reaction, uh, interaction has a chance to manifest itself. If, on the other hand, you think the really important role of neighborhood isn't this localized social interaction, but it's where this neighborhood sits in the broader metropolitan space of resources. For example, is it part of a good performing school district? Is it part of a political jurisdiction that has decent public services, like prenatal health care and recreation and police enforcement and so forth? Is it accessible to employment or public transportation to get you to employment? If it's that larger scale notion of your place in the metropolitan area that is having the biggest influence on your opportunities, then uh, the implication is the neighborhood level of mixing can be a much bigger geographic scale. So it's so cheap and easy for an academic to say we need more research. It's self-serving, but you're absolutely right. On this one, we, we really don't have a good sense about what it is about neighborhood that seems to have the biggest influence on people's lives. There's lots of evidence that suggests it's both some degree of these intimate social interactions and it's these larger macro structural position in the metropolitan hierarchy that is an influence. But which one's the more important one quantitatively? I don't think we actually know. The second thing I wanted to respond to was Michael's uh, question about what we can learn from other places around the world. Well, obviously the answer in America is nothing because they're all socialists. All right, I'll answer it. I, I, I'm, I'm in the place where all the socialists from Scandinavia moved to set up a state, so I'm, I'm friendly territory here. But in my many studies uh, in, in Netherlands and Scandinavia, what they clearly have done is make social mix a national strategy. And they do this in a context where affordable housing is a right, where some kinds of assisted housing, whether it be provided through uh, one subsidy mechanism or another, and I don't want to go into those details, but uh, we're talking about in Sweden, 40% of the population effectively getting some kind of social housing assistance, uh, similar kinds of percentages in the Netherlands, and sure, 
what some of us might think that's completely unacceptable because that's socialism. But what they essentially do is that when they build new housing estates, they have an equivalent to inclusionary zoning because they build estates at different kinds of housing types, housing sizes, housing price points, some rental, some owner. There's a lot of diversity built into the buildings when they build new construction. And because everyone has, through this subsidy system, the economic ability to, to locate virtually any place they want to, uh, that gives them huge choices. So there's both choice in terms of where the physical locations of different kinds of dwellings are located spatially, and then that because the folks have such a base level of subsidy, there's a lot of choice from their individual perspective to allow them to say, well, I want to move to this part of the city because that's where I'm closest to family or jobs, and I know there'll be some appropriate housing stock for me to, to find in that part of the city. So it's this lovely mixture, both in the geography of the hard built environment and a mixture in terms of the choices that the, that the people get because of the, the baseline welfare system that they have that together creates a lot more diverse neighborhoods, uh, which is their social goal. They, they view segregation as a major challenge and threat to the future well-being of their society. We haven't figured that out here. We haven't come to that conclusion in America. I think that's tragic. I wonder, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about your Richmond work, but also um, when, you, when you talk about uh, income mixing, um, I, I know in some of your articles you suggest that it's not necessarily uh, mixing low income and upper income that doesn't, that's as effective, but it tends to be more effective when residential mixing occurs, when, when incomes tend to be closer to one, to one another. So I wonder if you could elaborate on that. Sure. Uh, the, the Richmond study that I'm alluding to was actually supported in part by the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond and it refers to a multi-year effort by the city of Richmond to do comprehensive neighborhood revitalization of six disadvantaged neighborhoods called the Neighborhoods in Bloom program. And in a quite remarkable example of focus, they allocated over 75% of their total community de development block grant budget for five years to these six neighborhoods, consisting of only 300 blocks in total. They leveraged several tens of millions of dollars from LISC in this effort as well. And they did a whole bunch of, of, of both hard community redevelopment, such as new streets and sewers and light fixtures. They did selective demolition. They, they encouraged selective infill construction. They did affordable housing so that the neighborhood had both options for higher income people but didn't displace lower income people as a result. So they ended up creating a much more revitalized set of neighborhoods that were more diverse on both racial and economic grounds as a consequence. And they did this by selectively targeting particular neighborhoods where their, their federal dollars and their foundation or LISC dollars could leverage the maximum amount of private market dollars. And it's that leveraging which is the important thing here. They regenerated investment by the private sector on top of the public and nonprofit money. And that's what triggered this successful outcome, a concentration focused targeting effort uh, in areas where you had essentially concentrated disadvantage, but you ended up with neighborhoods that were revitalized without the classic gentrification displacement consequence that we too often see with market-driven processes. So I think that, that offers a, a very important lesson to a lot of communities about how one of these options for diversity, that's diversifying areas of concentrated disadvantage, is feasible to do without its negative consequences. Uh, now, the income, the income mixing. Uh, from studies that were actually done with a, a wonderful database from Sweden, we actually found out that the most advantaged situations of mix in terms of increasing economic opportunities for modest income Swedish residents was when their neighbors were middle income neighbors, not when their neighbors were high income neighbors. 
And we hypothesized that in mixed neighborhoods, two things might be happening that are relevant from the perspective of the disadvantaged members of that mix. One is that, okay, your more advantaged neighborhoods might have value, neighbors, excuse me, might have valuable information and other resources that in principle it would be good for you to get. A tip about a new job, for example. However, you also have to have enough social in common with that neighbor to be able to be part of that network. And we hypothesize that if the social distance is too great, if the people at the bottom are socially so different from the people in the top in that neighborhood, that those social bonds are simply not going to get built. And so this potentially valuable information that resides in the high income neighbors doesn't filter down to the lower income neighbors because the social gap is too small, or too large, excuse me. So what we need is a filler in that neighborhood, if you will, of modest income folks who can bridge that social gap and provide a conduit for the transmission of apparently these valuable resources. So that suggests that neighborhoods that have the super rich next to the super poor are not going to be neighborhoods, even though they're mixed, that are going to provide too many advantages for the folks at the bottom. You identified the thresholds based on rental values and another one based on income. Are there other thresholds that we should be aware of? Great question, thank you. Uh, yes, there are indeed. One of the more important ones is the one that I alluded to in the Neighborhoods in Bloom redevelopment program in Richmond. Uh, that and some other work suggest that there are what you could call reinvestment thresholds. Minimum amounts of public expenditures that need to be applied to a disadvantaged area before the market is going to pay enough attention to reinvest its own money on top of it. And in the, in the Richmond case, it's our best guesstimation is it might be around $50,000 per block that was necessary. And this, is in the, this is a program that ran for five years in, in basically the, the late 90s. So there's a little inflation that has to be done there. But that, that's our guesstimate of the kind of scale of, of intervention. And that's, again, an amount of money that has to be committed over five years so that, again, the market has some kind of certainty that, indeed, the public sector is going to be seriously behind this revitalization activity for a considerable amount of time. Uh, that's, that's one other important threshold that has been identified quite, quite consistently and importantly. That's, that's the, the threshold, if you will, of a neighborhood on an improving trajectory. The previous one I talked about is often on a, on a downward trajectory when the concentrations of poverty get too great. So there are thresholds for a neighborhood heading in a decline trajectory and also thresholds heading in an improvement trajectory. Both of those dynamics, I think, are, are very nonlinear and require thresholds to bump them in both directions. What a wonderful, terrible question. It's wonderful because it's so on target, and it's terrible because it's so difficult to answer. I, I won't pretend to, to know the answer to the essential chicken and egg problem that you pose here. My, my sense is that to an increasing degree, we have convinced ourselves as a nation that we are in a equal opportunity society, that we're in a post-civil rights society. After all, we passed all these civil rights laws, right? Uh, we now treat women equal to men. We don't discriminate much in this society, so this, this individualized discrimination is a thing of the past. Uh, 
sure, okay, we, we, we allow people to get to different locations because some are richer and some are poor, but that's the American way. We're going to tolerate that. Nevertheless, it's still a society where with enough individual effort, you can make it. I think that's our central ideology. ideology. Well, my personal conclusion after long decades of being interested in this subject is that equal opportunity is a sham in a segregated society. <laughs> Thank you. It sounds like a political rally. Okay, you want, you want more rhetoric? Okay, we can get there. Um, and the reason is because I think increasingly we have been building our metropolitan spaces in ways that your opportunity is shaped by the place where you grow up. Because it's increasingly defining the kinds of violence you're exposed to, toxins you're exposed to, school systems you're exposed to, peers you're exposed to, public resources you're exposed to, job accessibility you're exposed to. Everything that shapes your opportunity structure is increasingly becoming spatially distinct. The Upper income groups who have obviously the most power to shape their environment and escape to the most advantaged places are increasingly codifying their intergenerational advantages through geography. And that's why I think we have to shake, you know, shake this notion of equal opportunity a little bit and get people to think more about spatial inequalities in opportunities. Because it's, it's something I don't think that most people have a sense of. And perhaps this little ideology re reboot is, is necessary if we're in fact trying to get to an equal opportunity society. I think to think about it more spatially is crucial if we're going to change, and here it comes, here's my next clause line. If we're going to change equal opportunity from its current situation, which is you know, a hollow promise into a hallowed premise. Mm -hmm. like, like that one? <laughs> That's true. One who was involved in the 70s in Minnesota politics, uh, what we did was we passed fiscal disparities. We changed state and local finance as they related to education and municipal government. Uh, we passed a robust state housing agency. I frankly thought that we had eliminated the basic barriers for diversifying our housing mix. <clears throat> uh, the opposite happened in the post-80s. Uh, the concentration of poverty grew rather than lessened. And I, I often wonder what caused that. The one big change that occurred was the incredible decimation of planning. All the federal requirements basically disappeared in 81, copied at the state level. Uh, the state planning agency in Minnesota which was a premier agency, doesn't exist anymore. And uh, yeah, I guess I'm curious what's happened elsewhere, but, 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 but all those barriers uh, disappeared, should have disappeared, the kind of things you were talking about, and the opposite happened. Now, I would only make one comment as it relates to the political campaign. If our presidential candidates were trying to focus on housing, rather than trying to tell us how they're going to micromanage elementary and secondary education. We'd be so far ahead, and the kids would be so far ahead. Thank you, Martin. Uh, despite the, the dismantling of what was the national model, and still in many regards is the national model in all those dimensions that you, met, that you did notice, uh, the Twin Cities is miles ahead of most metropolitan areas. In, in terms of its lack of concentrated disadvantage. I, I know it, it's viewed locally still as a worrisome issue, but believe me, you got it good. I'm from Detroit. 
Exactly, exactly. And George has, we've got, I'm watching the clock, and we have time for two short questions, and I've had two hands here. And two short answers, too. And two short yeah. answers. And George has a book that's available out here on driving Detroit, which is a fine analysis in a different kind of way that I would ask you to take a look at. But we have two people who had questions here. Uh, thank you, Congressman Sable, for the lead-in. I'm Jay Wilkinson. I'm an attorney at Legal Aid in Minneapolis, and we're talking about my clients here. Um, one of the things that's happening right now is that the Metropolitan Council is looking at what will our region, how can we have our region be better in the year 2040. One of the things that I and a number of other people, please raise your hand so you can find us later, are working on this, are focusing on trying to get a regional fair housing and equity uh, structure to that and one of the new things that we're doing is looking beyond the idea of, of racially concentrated areas of poverty to recognize that every neighborhood has some advantage every neighborhood has some disadvantage and that we need to bring uh, all those advantages to, uh, to all the people in our community so um, look for people that are raising their hands to uh, talk more about it later thank you I'm Al Hester. I work with public housing in St. Paul, so we're talking about some of my clients, too. And I'd like to point out that, at least in the Twin Cities, concentrated pro poverty isn't always a proxy for failure. Public housing in the old model of fairly large developments is still working very well, and it, it's showing up on some of the maps as the dark shaded areas. They're not going to change. That doesn't represent a failure to combat po poverty. It, in many cases, is turnover of people successfully moving out of those areas and being replaced. Right. I don't know how much that is reflecting the immigrant enclave because we do have significant immigrants. But we also have communities that are supportive in many ways, uh, rich social services. Not enough, but I uh, appreciate your analysis. Uh, I like your discussion of neighborhoods and the difficulties there. I'm sure you're familiar with HUD's small FMR demonstration that we think is going to fail because it can't characterize neighborhoods, plus the resources aren't there, that overwhelming statistic of the inadequacy the federal support, as George Landmer says, affordable housing is an issue with strong bipartisan non-support. Thank, <laughs> thanks for your doing. Thank you. Oh. Hi. Um, so I'm interested in, um, I haven't read your book or anything, I don't know much about you except from what I've heard today, but from my understanding, your studies are based mostly on research you've done in Europe, and I'm curious about how that applies to America, because America is a very different situation racially than, you know, the levels of differentiation that you'd see in Europe, in Scandinavia, and in the Netherlands where you talked about. And I think that something very important in creating a successfully mixed society or su successfully mixed neighborhood is understanding the other people you're going to be around and creating dialogue with them rather than just having a research project studying, with, studying them. And I want to know how you have done that, incorporated that into your studies in order to apply it here? And, you know, how can we trust that what you're saying would work here? Um, has there been any research, any discussion with people here? Fine. The, the statistics that I showed intentionally were only based on United States data. So all of those important nonlinear relationships were only based on U.S. data. So that I didn't import from Europe. That's an important thing to know. Some of the answers to the other questions were, were about the European experience. And I completely agree with your point that certain kinds of historical racial divides that we have faced in this country are not applicable to the history of Europe. However, a lot of the current research coming out of Europe is relevant because of the increasing recent ethnic diversification of Scandinavian society. For example, Right now, Sweden has a higher percentage of foreign-born residents in the United States. And yes, they do. And many of them are people of color from Somalia. Many of them are Muslim. And right now, Sweden is having to face these challenges of diversity, not only in class terms, but in ethnic and religious terms that they never had to face before. So many of these studies although different in detail, are studies, I think, that are relevant in terms of this multi-dimensional of diversity that we've, we've faced for a long time. And, and I agree that it's, 
it's important, uh, an important role of residential mixing is indeed the breaking down of stereotypes that you talked about that comes about with closer interpersonal interaction. There is a long history of the contact hypothesis that social psychologists have verified is an important dimension of breaking down stereotypes is to actually live among other folks that you realize, gee, they don't fit the stereotypes, and so that disconfirms these prejudicial preconditions. That's a bigger social goal that you can't quantify, but it's another very good reason of why mixing is an important social goal, so I thank you for bringing that up. Gary. Forever questions, but what I want to do is to simply honor the time and thank George and Michael for not only a stimulating, but hopefully a provocative in a sense of bringing some of us to new kinds of agency and involvement. Uh, George and I began our work together and as we ordered something today at the Seward Cafe, we looked up and there was a big eagle across the place, 1974. And we said, oh my goodness, that's when we first met. So whatever comment that is, I want to again thank George for coming and Michael for adding that perspective and for all of you uh, for being here. And if you didn't, if you're from off campus and you didn't put your name and email on that list out front, please stop so we can be sure to notify you in future Sabo Symposia and uh, take a look at George's book, Driving Detroit, which is also available uh, out in the lounge. But thank you again, all of you, for being with us. And thank you. <laughs>